I probably chit-chatted enough. I'm going to give an official welcome to everybody. Hi, my name is Susie Spickle. I'm the Community Programs Director and one of the naturalists here at the Harris Center. And we're so excited tonight to have Stephen Lamont join us and share what he knows about winter birds of this region. You're all in for a treat. Stephen is just fabulous. Don't You don't mind. So I think that's all kind of the business I have other than to say welcome and to tell you a tiny bit about the Harris Center, which is in Hancock, New Hampshire. Some of you might know all about the Harris Center. Maybe you've been visited us before or participated in another program, but I'm just going to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit in case you're new to us. And that's the Harris Center is a land trust that has been teaching people and helping people fall in love with the natural world in the Monadnock region for over 50 years. We've also been very busy protecting land. We have over 24,000 acres of protected land. Many of it's open um, for you to come walk and, and visit. And we spend a lot of our time doing education um, because we really feel that that's a big part of people feeling connected to a place is learning about it. And tonight, we're really lucky because we have Stephen Lamont, who is an ecologist and an avid birder, and he's such a great asset to this area. He's recently moved to Hancock, and we're so lucky he's joined our board at the Harris Center, so he'll be helping to make some future decisions about the Harris Center. When he's not busy attending board meetings and searching for sawwood owls, he works for um, Moosewood Ecological, which um, keeps him pretty busy doing probably a lot of GIS work and natural resource inventories and just helping people make good choices about how to manage their land. Um, so tonight, we're lucky too. I, um, this is a great introduction to those of for those of you who haven't met Stephen before, he's going to be offering a course for the Harris Center this coming winter called iNaturalist for Beginners. Um, and um, if you're interested in finding more out about that, I'll put that in the link once I'm finished chit chatting, which I'm just about done. Tonight, if you have any questions for Stephen as he's going along giving his talk, feel free to put them in the chat and I will um, ask those questions to him at the end. He's promised to save 15 minutes for questions and answers. So I think that's all other than let's give Stephen a big warm welcome for tonight. Yay. Thank you. And Stephen, take it away. Sure. Thank you so much, Susie, for a wonderful introduction. Um, I, I plan on having a mug of hot cocoa to raise and say, did everybody else bring their warm beverage with them for tonight's talk? Uh, but it was a little too warm today for me to actually want a hot chocolate. Uh, but hopefully as the winter months settle in, uh, it'll be getting colder outside, uh, but the winter birds will still be out there. Alrighty, welcome to winter birds of the Monadnock region. Uh, tonight, we'll be covering an introduction to a number of species found in southern and southwestern New Hampshire, um, and how on earth are they staying warm throughout our coldest months of the year. Uh, and then we'll talk about a little bit about species identification and ways that you can get involved with saving species and helping conserve them uh, for future generations to enjoy. So not too many birds actually stick around for the winter, but a number of them do so that birders like myself and bird enthusiasts like everybody who's here uh, can still get to enjoy a lot of the birds. However, most of our birds like this Baltimore Oriole and the really colorful Scarlet Tanager, they head far south for the winter. They prefer the tropics. Uh, and where I know some of us also like to get away during the winter, uh, but many of us will return for cross country skiing and snowboarding and other winter activities. So birds are kind of similar. Some of them stick around um, and some of them head farther south. So which birds actually stick around for the winter? Well, here in New Hampshire, uh, roughly 150 species are regularly encountered. So this is the entire state. Uh, we have things on the seacoast where the salt water doesn't really freeze during the winter uh, to even high up in the White Mountains where we can find Canada jays and boreal chickadees. Um, and here in the Monadnock region, we have a really great mix of habitats that attract a diversity of birds. So not all of the ones pictured here are found in the Monadnock region, uh, but each of these colorful specimens uh, from the harlequin duck to the common eider to even the surf scooter, I just love their colorful bill. Uh, all of these these birds can be found in New Hampshire. So if you're willing to drive just a little distance, uh, there's a lot of birds that are out there to be seen. So 
When it comes to winter birds, there's a couple ways that they can be categorized. With most scientific things, they can be sliced and diced into multiple and multiple different ways. But when it comes to winter birds, we typically divide them into two different categories. There are the birds that are the year-round residents, like our common black-capped chickadees and northern cardinals, morning doves, and white-breasted nuthatches. These birds are present year-round, which means they're also here during the winter. And then there's just the winter birds. These are the ones that are here only during the winter season. So the dark-eyed juncos have come down out of the White Mountains or off the top of Mount Monadnock into the Ashwalet River Valley or the Kentuckook River Valley uh, where people can enjoy them around their feeders. Pine siskins will fly south from Canada and other parts north. Uh, American tree sparrows and common red poles as well also fly south and end up here in southern New Hampshire to spend the winter. So some winter birds also include birds that migrate south during the winter, but not the entire population. So things like Canada goose, eastern bluebird, and American robin um, will stay around during winter months. So I've produced this graph here. Let's break it down. We have time on the y, uh, sorry, on the x-axis down at the bottom. So these are different weeks throughout the year, going from January on the left to December uh, on the right, and then on the y-axis. We have uh, detection frequency. So this is how likely it is um, that this species can be seen. And here's our winter months going from December all the way uh, through the end of February. So if we look at these bar charts, American Robin is in green. They're less common during the winter, but they're still here. Same as Eastern Bluebirds, um, relatively constant year round, and they've been increasing over the past couple of decades. Uh, and then Canada Goose, um, once all the water freezes, they're pretty much gone from the Monadnock region. But along the Connecticut River and some other larger rivers, wherever there's open water, we can typically find waterfowl, uh, even in the heart of winter. So we are inland, we're not on the seacoast. Um, we typically see here in the Monadnock region between 30 to 70 species during the winter. Uh, a lot of these are common year round woodland species like the barred owl, uh, hairy woodpecker, tufted titmouse. I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with a lot of these species. They might be visiting your feeders. And of course, common ravens will flock to Mount Monadnock during the winter. Um, sometimes in groups ranging from 30 to 50 birds can be seen swirling around the summit. So there's still some decent diversity here in the Monadnock region. Um, it's not quite the seacoast, but there's a lot of special birds that do visit. So how are they staying warm? We're going to go through a quick background, so a little biology 101, and talk about metabolism and thermoregulation. There's two different kinds of that. One is physical. Uh, the other one is behavioral. I'll also introduce the habit of food caching, and then we'll talk about eruptions, spelled with an I. So I'm sure this question is on the forefront of many of your minds. Well, when the water freezes, how are birds getting anything to drink? Uh, well, during spring, summer, and fall, we often see birds visiting bird baths to drink um, and also to bathe. During the winter, the options for bathing go down, um, and as well as the options for drinking liquid water. However, with all uh, vertebrate animals, this includes birds and humans, um, they go through, go through a process called metabolism where we're burning calories uh, using oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide and we create something called metabolic water. So to get that, we start with a process called glycolysis and this produces two adenosine triphosphate particles. And this is, gives us a little bit of energy. The, uh, the ATP or adenosine triphosphate, these are our energy dollars. So we get a little bit from glycolysis that's based, based mostly on sugars and simple carbohydrates. And then we go into a more complicated Krebs cycle. In a nutshell, this is what creates the carbon dioxide in our bodies and birds' bodies. And this is why we need to exhale carbon dioxide out of our bodies. We then go to a third system, the electron hydrogen transport system, and this creates a lot of energy, 32 adenosine triphosphate, and this requires our oxygen. So this is why humans and birds need to breathe in oxygen in order to get the energy from the calories that we're burning. And the byproduct from this process is water. 
So just by digesting food, birds and humans are creating water as a byproduct. So if you don't see birds drinking water during the winter, it's okay. They're staying hydrated just by eating food. So let's compare two different species. So biologists will calculate uh, a metabolic rate for various species. Um, compared to humans, their body temperatures are a little hotter, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is true for most birds around the world. Um, however, these two birds are drastically different in size. I'm sure many of you have seen black-capped chickadees and mute swans. One you could hold in your hand. In fact, you could fit four black-capped chickadees in your hand, whereas a mute swan would need both arms to hold. The black-capped chickadee has a high surface-to-volume ratio, ratio. It's a small bird, whereas the mute swan, being much larger, has a larger core mass to its body, has a low surface-to-volume ratio. And so this, in turn, affects the metabolic rate of the birds. The black-capped chickadee has a faster heart rate. It's burning calories more rapidly with that higher metabolic rate compared to the mute swan. And this allows both species to maintain that key temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, um, even though they're vastly different sizes. So black capped chickadees, their heart rate is absolutely pounding throughout the entire day. Mute swans, heartbeat is a little slower, um, and they're remaining the same body temperature. However, it's really complicated and here in the Monadnock region. We have temperature swings. It's hot one day and cold the next. So how are their bodies actually accounting for these temperature swings? During the spring when it's a little bit warmer, so think of a, a warm day in November or mid-March, um, a black-capped chickadee might spend about 30 minutes feeding. And the rest of the time, it's looking for a place to spend the night, interacting with other chickadees, um, and searching for uh, additional food that it might eat at a later time. However, in really cold regions, so a little bit farther north in the Monadnock region, think on top of the White Mountains or farther north into Canada, places where boreal chickadees live, they're spending 20 times more looking for food, roughly 10 hours a day during the winter um, when it's below zero degrees outside. That's how much effort it takes to find enough food, find enough calories for them to burn in order to stay warm. It's as if as humans, we spent all day looking for food. We wouldn't be able to have full-time jobs um, or do things for pleasure. Our entire daylight time would be spent looking for food. So these birds, despite their size, are quite industrious. And they have a single-minded purpose uh, for finding and eating enough food to stay warm. Now, staying warm, once you've ingested those calories, is a whole nother challenge. We know that birds have feathers, which help keep them warm, but the entire bird's body is not feathered. So we need um, scaly feet to help them grip on, onto branches, uh, and then a sharp beak um, to help them eat food. And if those two body parts were feathered, um, the bird probably wouldn't survive. So here on the left is an image um, looking through a, a thermal sensor at this bird. And we can see that the beak is very close to its core body temperature. 104 degrees Fahrenheit. But the rest of the bird is fairly well insulated uh, by those feathers. And of course, eastern bluebirds are famous for doing this. They will huddle, huddle together uh, on cold winter nights in order to stay warm. So let's talk a little bit about feathers. Uh, there's a number of different kinds of feathers. This diagram I've put together here is a simplified version. And the top right is our flight feather. We might see these while hiking or elsewhere on the ground, um, usually fairly colorful and large. The body feathers are a little less common. You might see one if a bird has been molting in your yard. Uh, and they're a mix of these um, uh, straight edged uh, feather pieces uh, and then the, the curly looking part of the feather. And these create air pockets, which are key for insulation. The insulation that we use in our houses is the exact same thing. It's creating small microscopic sized air pockets that are trapping air and holding heat 
closer to the source. And so the champion feather for insulation is the down feather. This is this is what we like to put on our eider down comforters or our goose down jackets. Uh, and this is what allows a bird like this Canada goose to stay perfectly warm while taking an ice bath uh, for half the morning before it goes to look for food. And so when we see birds out in the water, despite uh, icebergs floating by, we don't see those here in the Monadnock region, um, but when in this icy water, birds are able to stay warm because of those down feathers. Um, birds also have an oil gland on their back, which they'll spread over their outer feathers. And this uh, helps as a, as, a, as a waterproofing agent uh, to make sure that the water is staying out uh, and isn't filling out those air pockets on the inside. How many of you have seen a duck or a goose or a gull walking on ice? And you think, gosh, its feet must be freezing. Um, I've walked on ice before and it's not a pleasant experience. Well, for these birds, uh, their feet are actually only just above freezing. However, their core temperature is staying 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And they're allowed to, they're able to do this by something called countercurrent heat exchange. So this is a really brilliant uh, process that's evolved over time where um, as warm blood from the core of the bird is flowing outwards into the feet through the arteries, it's positioned adjacent to the vein, which is carrying cold blood from the feet back into the body. So rather than the bird losing heat from warm blood flowing out and cold blood flowing in, it's exchanging the heat from the artery on the right hand side to the vein on the left hand side. So that as warm blood is flowing out, it's warming the cold blood that's flowing in and vice versa. The cold blood is cooling down the warm blood that's flowing out. So actually very little heat energy is lost despite the feet um, being exposed to the cold temperatures. And so here we have the, the temperatures in different parts of the bird's foot uh, close just above freezing. This is 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the core temperature of the bird right where those feathers start uh, is about 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius. So again, that's countercurrent heat exchange, and that's what allows a bird's feet not to freeze, even though it's been standing on the ice all morning. So then there's also some behavioral adaptations for how birds can help stay warm during the winter. First is tucking. Uh, either feet or the bill can be tucked. You might see gulls or geese standing on one leg, um, so that they're, they're further reducing the amount of heat that is lost to the environment. So covering up those unfeathered surfaces is really important in extremely cold weather. Also, puffing or fluffing. Uh, and so as this happens, the, the bird sort of tucks its head down, um, tucks its feet under its body, and then fluffs out its feathers. So there's small minuscule muscles at the base of each feather, and it can control um, how how puffed out they are. So there's a morning dove here on the left and a blue jay here on the right. Um, and they're tolerating really cold temperatures just fine because they're able to keep their core body temperature at that magic number, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, humans have paid attention to this. We do the same thing. Uh, here's George Costanza in a really uh, large puffy jacket, um, and that's probably filled with goose or some other uh, goose down or some other bird's feathers. So it, they, they play a large role in keeping us warm, and that's because of the small air pockets trapped in the feathers that are keeping heat closer to our body. This is more of a subtle behavior. I don't tend to experience it much when I'm out and about looking for birds. Um, but when you do see it, um, your first instinct might be to, is, what's wrong with that bird? It doesn't look right. It has its wings splayed out and the head at an odd angle. But what it's doing is it's orienting its body towards the sun. Uh, so this behavior is called sunning, where it's allowing this direct heat and warmth from the sun uh, to warm up its body. So a couple of things to look for when you're identifying sunning behavior. First, the wings are typically drooped and towards the side. The back feathers, the breast feathers, the throat feathers, um, a lot of the bird's body feathers are erected uh, to allow for heat to penetrate into those deeper feathers that are closer to the body. 
The bird's typically in a sitting position, which saves more energy than being in a standing position. Um, and lastly, the back or the full side will be oriented towards the sun, again, to maximize the amount of solar radiation and heat going onto that bird. So it's like a living solar panel, except instead of getting solar, um, the light from, from the sun, it's getting the, the heat coming from it. Okay, let's talk about torpor. I imagine many of you might be familiar with this. Uh, this ruby-throated hummingbird in the top left is not dead, I promise. Uh, it's just slipped while it was sleeping uh, in a torpid state and is now hanging upside down. And so torpor is when a bird goes into a controlled state of hypothermia. It goes into hypothermia on purpose in order to save energy. So remember that ideal body temperature is 104 degrees Fahrenheit. But when a bird goes into torpor, it drops its body temperature by 50 degrees, going all the way down to about 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this um, does an amazing job of saving energy. It uses about its metabolic rate, which we talked about earlier, earlier is one third that of what it's doing when it's awake uh, and resting. And so it's burning a third uh, to, or it's burning one third of the calories in a torpid state than it is when it's active. Um, so chickadees will do this. Um, they'll do it in the Monadnock region in extreme weather conditions. Think about a three day blizzard um, or temperatures well under 20 degrees uh, below zero. So it doesn't happen too often, but birds farther north uh, will do this. And of course, Ruby-throated hummingbirds are more susceptible because of their really high uh, surface to volume ratio. And so they might do that if there's a cold snap as they're migrating. Red-tailed hawks do not go into torpor, but they will on cold nights reduce their body temperature by about five to seven degrees. So not nearly as drastic as the black-capped chickadee or ruby-throated hummingbird, um, but even larger birds um, can manually uh, decrease their, their body temperature, much like a thermostat on the wall. They're able to control that. Now this does save a lot of energy, uh, but it can, it's very energy, energetically expensive to get out of a torpid state. Think about letting your wood stove die out overnight. You have to put in a lot of effort to get it, go, uh, to get it started up again. Um, and if there's a predator nearby, these birds will be very sluggish to get out of that torpid state in order, and back to, back to functionally functioning normally. Um, so it's risky, but it can save energy. So some ways to, to avoid going into a torpid state is to build up their fat reserves. Um, there's a house finch here on the left gorging on, on a crab apple tree. And the photo on the right is the feathers of an American goldfinch. This bird is still alive. Um, they're just parted a little bit so that you can see the, the fatty reserves, one down on the belly, one up near the throat. And then these are the pectoral muscles, those really strong flight muscles that all birds have. Most birds, I should say. So the fat shows up as this yellowish color. Um, this is taken by a researcher at a bird banding station where they're monitoring the birds and checking to see how healthy they are by looking at their fat reserves going into the winter season. And so builds can almost double their body weight um, by building up fat reserves prior to winter. So it helps not only with energy, you know, they're storing those calories on their body, uh, but also extra insulation to stay warm. Another way that birds will stay warm uh, is by building a snow bed. Uh, so this is a common activity for ruffed grouse um, in deep fluffy snow. So if we, if we have another winter where the snow isn't very deep, um, ruffed grouse won't be able to tunnel under the snow. Uh, but when they do, they can keep these dens as warm as 32 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and they'll never drop below 20 degrees Fahrenheit, even if the temperature above the snow layer um, is down as low as negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit. That snow bed will be nice and toasty, relatively speaking, uh, about 32, 20 to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so if you're out walking in the, word, in the woods and you see this uh, sort of pattern in the snow, this is a rough grouse. Uh, here's the wing pattern on the left coming out of its snow bed somewhere here. Another bird that will create snow beds, they'll sleep under the snow on really cold nights, is the snow bunting. Uh, this is a common winter bird here in the Madnock region in the right habitat. So head to the nearest agricultural field, um, 
or anywhere that the plows have been um, in a big area to expose some of the dirt and seeds that are there as well. And that's the primary food source for the snow bunting as well as several other species. But this bird will dive into the snow tunnel for, for many feet, even meters, um, before creating a little uh, cave under the snow to keep warm overnight. So again, this is more in extreme conditions and only when the snow is deep and fluffy. So for birds that don't tunnel in the snow, they still find shelter somehow. Uh, so some really important places for birds to shelter here in the Monadnock region are conifer trees. That's a really big one. Um, or rhododendron bushes, things that will keep their leaves year round. It helps reduce wind speed. It's also a great protection from predators. Uh, they're less able to see into that dense um, then the dense conifer branches. Um, brush piles can be a great one if you have those set up in your yard or in the backyard. Um, they're a wonderful hiding spot for sparrows um, and, and plenty of other birds. And uh, brush piles and conifer trees often have a lot of tasty food morsels uh, for birds to eat as they're getting ready for bed, so to speak, or when they wake up uh, in the morning. Uh, there might be some insects that are hibernating under a bark crevice. Um, so not only do to, to shelter, provide safety and warmth, um, but often, often food as well. So let's talk more about chickadees because they're one of my favorite wintering birds. Um, how many of you have bird feeders? I imagine a good number of you have currently have bird feeders or have had bird feeders in the past. And sometimes we'll observe chickadees eating the food right at the feeders. Um, other times they'll grab a bite and fly away. Sometimes they'll eat it on a preferred branch, but other times they'll cache it and save it for later. Uh, maybe it's the next day or maybe it's months down the road. Uh, they'll remember that location. So there's, this, there's a researcher out in the Rocky Mountains and he studies mountain chickadees. We don't have that species here in the Monadnock region, but um, his findings are still relevant to our local black capped chickadee. And what he found is that the hypothalamus region of the chickadee's brain, so that's, and humans have that too, and that's important for spatial memory. He followed chickadees around and his graduate students, and they found that chickadees would hide about 80,000 food caches. That's an eight followed by four zeros. They would hide them and remember most of those locations. Incredible. Um, if I lose my car keys, it might take me an hour to find them. These birds are hiding 80,000 food morsels and remembering most of those locations. And they do that by doubling the size of their hippocampus. Humans are not capable of doing that. Um, how they do it is they're growing new brain cells and regenerating old brain cells. So some uh, researchers who are studying Alzheimer's disease are looking at this uh, brain tissue regeneration in black capped chickadees to see if they can make any breakthroughs with helping Alzheimer's patients. So some really incredible stuff going on inside the brain of a chickadee, tiny but powerful. So I'd like to move over to two birds, the common red pole and red crossbill. Uh, these birds uh, can be common in the Monadnock region during winter. Um, and even red crossbills will sometimes breed in the Monadnock region if there's abundant food. Now, they will sometimes cache food, but what they'd rather do is store it in their throat. Uh, so if any of you have chickens or have raised geese or ducks, uh, those birds have what's called a crop in their throat, uh, as well as a number of raptors. These two species have a similar structure in their throat called an esophageal diverticulum. You can throw that out uh, at your next party. And what this is, is it's a bilobed uh, pocket in their throat where they can store undigested seeds. And what they'll do is they go through a three-stage feeding process. So red poles love birch catkins. If you have birch trees nearby, uh, check them this winter for common red poles. The first step that they'll, do, that they'll do in this feeding process is knock the seeds out of the tree, sometimes ingesting a couple here and there. Once the seeds are on the ground, maybe on top of a nice fresh snow layer, these birds will hop down and pick up those seeds and store them uh, in their esophageal diverticulum. And then, especially towards the evening, once they're getting ready to stop foraging for the day, it's getting too dark out, they'll get ready for the night, they'll fluff up their feathers to stay warm, and then they'll start ingesting uh, those seeds that are stored um, in their throat so that they can keep eating uh, to make it through a long, cold night. 
So let's move over to another set of finches, evening grosbeaks. I, I vividly remember the first time I ever saw these. It was on Halloween day in 2016. Um, these are a, a wonderful winter finch um, that, that come to the Monadnock region in most winters. However, not all winters. So let's take a look at this graph here on the left. Um, we have a, an abundance index on the Y scale. So how abundant evening gross beaks are at this particular Christmas bird count. Um, and then the year is on the X axis going from 1960 to about 2000. And we see that generally speaking, every other year there would be a population boom in winter evening gross beak uh, populations and then a decline and then a boom and then a decline. And so for a while, scientists weren't really sure what was causing this, but after some further study, it was linked, of course, to their food source. So for evening gross beaks and, and a number of, of other eruptive species, things that move south quickly but irregularly, uh, it's closely tied to their food. So uh, a lot of these birds are eating spruce cones and pine cones, the seeds that are tucked in in those cones. Um, so a poor year on the left might look something like this where there's few cones on a tree. And then there's a bumper crop over on the right where these trees are producing many, many corns, uh, sorry, many, many pine cones. Um, here in the Monadnock region, two or three years ago, we had a, a bumper year or a mast year for acorns. And the following year, the squirrel population was huge. Uh, there, we saw photographs of squirrels swimming across lakes uh, in order to find more food. And so it's similar with the eruptive winter species that we see. Their, their diet is closely tied to these key food resources. And when those food resources are no longer available, the birds head south and end up in the Monadnock region um, or farther south to find more food. So here's an example of that relationship. Uh, so we have the cone crop in blue is a really good year, the third year of the study. Um, and then the eruptive species, because there was so much food the prior year, their population does really well. Uh, and then the next year, the crop starts to decline. So the population moves south for the winter. And so we see this happen in cycles uh, where the, the population, the eruptive years for, for a particular species like evening grosbeak is very closely tied to when the crop failure happens in Canada. So I've talked about eruptive songbirds for a couple minutes now. What are the different species that actually show up here in the Manmac region? Well, there's the Bohemian waxwings, one of my favorite, uh, the cedar waxwing, which is a year round resident, uh, but we'll get more of them in the winter, some, some winters. The pine grosbeak is a great one to keep an eye out for, the evening grosbeak. Our black capped chickadees will erupt southward. So last year was an eruptive year for black capped chickadee, and they could be found. Um, in Maryland, which is where which they're typically not found in. They don't make it that far south. The boreal chickadee, uh, there were a couple last year in south in southern New Hampshire. Typically they stay in northern New Hampshire. The red-breasted nuthatch, a year-round species here in the Monadnock region, uh, but they will also erupt southward. Pine siskin uh, is usually an annual winter visitor to the Monadnock region, but some winters they're just drowning your bird feeders. Common red poles and the more rare hoary red pole uh, will erupt southward. And then there's the red crossbill and closely related white winged crossbill. Uh, both of those I would look for in spruce habitats in the Monadnock region. And raptors as well can erupt southward. So if you enjoy snowy owls, I think most people do, um, they're not abundant every year, but every so often during an invasion year or an eruption year, uh, you can see multiple snowy owls from the same vantage point. So here in the Monadnock region, the best place to check for snowy owls uh, are the Dillon Hopkins Airport uh, in North Swansea, so near Keene, uh, and other really large agricultural areas where they can hunt uh, on, on voles and other small rodents. And then there's the short-eared owl and rough-legged hawk. Um, these animals also dine on, uh, on mammals in the tundra uh, that have these cyclical population booms. And so these raptors, after a poor year of, of food up north, they'll head south for the winter to find enough, enough food to survive. So 
those are a lot of the birds, not all of them. Those are many of the birds that can be found in the Nadnock region during winter. Um, what can we do to help save them? Well, the first thing I like to recommend to people is get involved in one of these community science projects. Uh, you don't have to have a scientific background to learn the often simple rules and guidelines for how to participate. So I'd like to put four projects on your radar uh, tonight. The first one is the popular Christmas bird count. This was started uh, in the year 1900, prior to which people would go out and see how many birds they could kill uh, on Christmas Day. Now we just go out and try to count as many birds as possible. So the goal is to census winter populations, get an idea for how they're faring over time. And there's a couple different count circles uh, which you could participate in in the Monadnock region. So I have the, the website up at the top uh, and Susie, perhaps you could put a link to this uh, in the chat before we end. And one of the goals of this data is to track these populations over time. So this is a mystery bird. I'll show a photo in a second. And you can see it's doing really well in the western part of the continent and also to the north. Uh, but its population has been declining in the winter in the southeast and especially in New Hampshire. So I'll give you five seconds to think about which species this map might represent. And then I'll go ahead and show you the answer. Okay, so this bird is the blue jay. Yes, it's very common. However, we're seeing in some parts of the country its population is declining, at least during the winter. We're not exactly sure why, but it's good that we have this long-term data set to help track those changes over time. The next project I want to introduce is Project Feeder Watch. And this was founded in 1987 by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Bird Studies Canada. So this is a project in the United States and Canada. Um, it runs from November through April. So if you'd like to sign up, you still can. Um, and the purpose is to survey birds that are coming to your feeders in your own backyard um, and the surrounding habitat. Uh, you get mailed a really great guide that'll help you identify the birds coming to your feeders, um, a, a great informational packet about how this project works and what data to specifically collect and how to count birds. That's a question I get a lot is, well, my feeder is so busy. How on earth do you count all the chickadees that are coming? So they have some great tips on how to do that. And here's the link down in the bottom right, feederwatch.org. So this project collects a lot of data. They're able to answer a lot of scientific questions from our observations that we share with the project. Uh, first one, similar to the Christmas bird count, uh, is what are the, the long-term trends in bird distribution and abundance? So how are these populations changing where they're living during the winter? Um, the timing and extent of those winter eruptions. So we think about the evening grosbeak or red crossbills. They're here some winters, um, more so in other winters, why is that? So looking at the timing and extent, um, in some years, uh, I think red crossbills and purple finches have gone all the way down to Texas, uh, which is pretty far. That would have been a big eruption year. This study also looks at um, where the winter populations are, the geographic range, um, as well as what, what kinds of food are the birds eating. So in this infographic on the right, of course, we see Baltimore Orioles like oranges and goldfinches like that Niger or thistle seed, cedar waxwings, of course, are frug frugivores eating lots of fruit. Uh, then lastly, how disease is spreading among birds that visit feeders. This is a really important topic uh, for house finches, especially in the Western United States. Um, and earlier this year, we had that mystery disease in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and a lot of Audubon societies were recommending that we take our bird feeders down until they figured out what it was. Um, and I still don't know if, if anything's been conclusively found about that disease, but it is safe to put up your bird feeders. Uh, a more local project is the New Hampshire Backyard Winter Bird Survey. This is coordinated by New Hampshire Audubon. Uh, it was started in the same year as Project Feeder Watch, but independently. Um, and this year, this winter season, um, it'll be February 12th and 13th. Um, and the goal is not just to count birds visiting your yard, but also squirrels. So if you have a squirrel interest or you have a, a lot of gray squirrels or red squirrels visiting your feeders, um, those observations can contribute as data points to this particular project. 
Uh, one of the goals is to look at the wintertime populations just in New Hampshire. So here's a graph going from 1987 uh, to 2018 or 19 with the number of birds that are tallied during the New Hampshire Backyard Winter Bird Survey. So back in the early 1990s, late 1980s, it was impossible to find eastern bluebirds and American robins in New Hampshire. But as, as the climate is warming and as winters are becoming more tolerable for more birds, uh, we're seeing that populations of bluebirds and American robins are increasing uh, during the winter. Uh, this latest drawdown in American robins, that population drop, could have been due to a decline in participation in this particular study um, or a number of other environmental factors. Uh, so hopefully it's not a cause for concern, uh, but more data would help us answer that question. So I encourage you to, to um, sign up for this project. You can find more information on New Hampshire birdrecords.org slash backyard winter bird survey. Um, the forms are mailed out in mid-January, so just sign up sometime before then. Uh, and lastly, um, this was actually the first community science project I ever did that was bird related. This is the Great Backyard Bird Count. Uh, it's been going on since 1998. It's currently run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the National Audubon Society, and it's President's Day weekend every year. Uh, the purpose, um, this is an international project and our goal is to count as many birds as possible. So that's birdcount.org uh, to get the most recent dates and how to join. Uh, so this is an international project and it was the first one ever that collected and displayed data in live time. So you could go onto the project website and see what birds are being found in India that minute or go down to Argentina or someplace you've never been in the world and look at all the cool bird names uh, that are coming in. So this is a great project to connect birders and bird enthusiasts around the world uh, over a single weekend. Um, so this one's really easy to participate in. And, well, they're, they're all pretty easily. The first goal for this is just to go outside or stay inside and watch out your window for 15 minutes. Keep track of all the birds that you're seeing um, and then submit it to a, to a community science database called eBird. Um, and then some, some numbers from, I think, two years ago, snow goose and common myrrh, Canada goose, many millions of these birds are being counted in a single weekend uh, as part of this project. Uh, we also get more detailed information about where species like the snowy owl are found during the winter. Uh, so this is from one winter. We can see some snowy owls made it to Bermuda and Mississippi and Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and here New, on the New Hampshire coast and down towards Plum Island, uh, the snowy owls are fairly common. So the darker the purple, the more common snowy owls were um, during that winter season. And before I turn it over to questions, I want to close with a really, really um, uh, interesting and fascinating graphic that's created from eBird data. So again, that great backyard bird count uh, data contributes to this modeling process. So I chose the American Robin. Susie, I was really glad you mentioned this before we got started. I said, ah, I have a special surprise for you at the end of the presentation. So this is a complicated map, but I'll break it down for you. As you look at the map, the darker the purple means there's more American robins present at that time of year. To know what time of year it is, follow this dark gray bar moving from left to right. So these are the month, uh, the first initials of each month going from January, February, March, all the way to October, November, December. So I'm gonna play this on loop and just sort of narrate what's happening to the American robin population throughout the course of the year. So it's starting in January. We see a lot of the American robins are concentrated in the southeast of the U.S., in parts of the Midwest, especially at lower elevations, uh, and then also in Northern California and Southern Oregon. Uh, there's a pretty high American robin population there during the winter. And again, to iterate, this data is all submitted by people like us who have a passion for birds and want to contribute to their conservation. So let's watch this, this video population surges north for the breeding season, breeding all the way up in northern Alaska and northern Canada. Fall migration, the population is concentrating and then back onto the wintering grounds. So I have this on loop so you can look at different places of the continent for different times of year. I think that peak American robin breeding is taking place close to Chicago, Illinois. So take a look at that during June and July. I don't know what's there that's attracting a lot of robins, but there they are. 
Uh, of course, Eastern Massachusetts, New Jersey, uh, the Mid-Atlantic coastline is a wonderful place for robins during the winter and migrations. Uh, you, we can see that American robins are present in New Hampshire year round. And if we look really closely, the Monadnock region is almost at the northern extent of the American robin distribution during the winter. So if you're if you're a member of eBird, it's free to sign up. You can view this map and more for over a thousand different species around the world uh, to see how their populations are moving around the world. I hope that one day our Sibley field guides will have these dynamic maps running in the bottom corner and they're not just a static map with really coarse resolution. So that's all I have for, for everybody. Um, are there any questions? Oh, yes, yeah, Stephen. First of all, that was fabulous. I mean, just so well presented, so clear, um, and so fascinating. And um, in the chat, there was lots of comments about, you know, wouldn't it be good to have a bird brain if you could regenerate your brain or, you know, have an extra stomach for when you were hungry and at night. So just so, so chock full of great information. And so well presented. Um, and there are questions. So I'm going to start with one um, that um, this person is wondering, why don't boreal birds go somewhere where finding food is easier? Like, why do they have to live so hard? That's yeah, question. great question. Well, if you ask them, they say, oh, we're not living that hard. What we're doing is we're staking a claim on this habitat and we're going to stay here year round uh, so that there's less competition from other birds. So for birds like our Scarlet Tanager and Baltimore Oriole that fly to the tropics, they now have to compete with millions of other birds and thousands of other species to find food. But the Canada Jays and the Boreal Chickadees that stay north in Canada, they're competing with themselves and that's about it. So there's less food but also less birds competing for those resources. Yeah, wow. Uh, the questions are rolling in. I'm going to try to get to a lot of them, but we might not get to all of them. But here's another one. Um, perhaps this is a pondering. Could there be less nerve endings in waterfowl's feet and that way they also don't feel the cold? Do you know anything about that? That's a great question. And I do not know the answer to that. Um, but I'd be happy to look it up. And Susie, I could send you a response at least. Oh, that would be great. And I can get it to Ruth who asked the question. Great. Thank um, you, Ruth. Great. Yeah. Okay. And here's a question um, from Francie and she's wondering, and I'm sure this is a great question for everybody is since it's December 2nd and we're allowed to put our bird feeders out if it's cold. Um, so this question is, what would you recommend for food to attract the most diverse groups of birds or maybe even feeder arrangement or anything about feeding the birds that gets us a diverse showing? Oh, fantastic question. I have a whole separate hour long presentation just on that topic, but I'll give you a, a 10 second response here. My personal favorites for go to feed food sources are black oil sunflower seeds. They have a great mix of fat and protein for birds, and it's all packed up in a, in a shell in a thinly shelled seed. So a lot of a lot of birds can crack that with their bills. Um, the other one I'll go with is uh, suet to attract woodpeckers and even late warblers uh, to my bird feeders. Just make sure you're getting healthy suet. There's no sodium or don't use bacon fat. Um, make sure you're getting suet from a reputable source. Uh, but suet and black oil sunflower seeds are my go-to. And then if you want finches, go with the thistle or niger seed. That's my recommendation. Wow. Well, Stephen, you, you might have just gotten another night uh, at <laughs> on Zoom because people want you to give that next talk, which I see Karen is giving like two thumbs up and, and people are requesting it in the chat. So um, that was such a great answer. So everybody got notes, black sunflower seeds, uh, suet, healthy suet, and um, the thistle. All right, here's another question. Um, this is a question, um, is it common for red-winged blackbirds to stick around in southeastern New Hampshire during the winter? This person must be seeing them. Great question. So it is common for red-winged blackbirds to be present. However, they won't be nearly as many as during migration season or even the breeding season. Um, the coastal part of New Hampshire is typically warmer than here in the, the Monadnock Highlands, the Monadnock region. And so we'll see more blackbirds uh, as well as other species hanging out closer to the coast during the winter. So it's still a delight to see one anywhere in New Hampshire, uh, but they're a little more expected closer to the coast. 
Cool. Um, here's a question from Patty, and it's a question I've wondered about um, since we seem to be having a lot of winters where we get snow and then we get this very thick layer of ice on top of the snow. And a lot of us notice that our owls are really struggling. And so we're wondering, is there anything you can do for owls that are having a hard time finding food? Anything you would recommend? Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, well, a little bit of background information for people who might not be familiar with this phenomenon is owls hunt mostly small mammals during the night um, and they can hear mammals moving in the snow, even if the mammals under a foot or two of snow. However, when we get that that warm spell and the snow freezes on top after it melts, the owls are unable to penetrate that to get the mammals. And so what they end up doing is hunting during the day to make up for lost hunting success during the night. And this leads to more owl strikes by automobiles uh, and other risks that they're not used to during daylight hours. So things to help them. Um, gosh, that's a great question. Um, I'd have to think more about that and get back to you, Susie. Unless you're breeding mice and releasing them every night, that probably won't be good for your bird feeders, but it might help the owls. I'll have to come up with a, a better solution than that. Yeah, I mean, because they're specialists on live prey, so it's not like you could really put out a, a dead mouse and they would take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, these birds can go several days without food, as long as they're getting a meal every now and then. Great. Okay. Um, I should have clustered this question with a question regarding food um, and feeding the birds. This is from um, John. He says he has a number of Carolina wrens around his house this summer, and he understands that they remain through the winter, but struggle. So what would be the best food source that he could put out for them at his feeder to help them? Good question. Um, so Carolina wrens, another resident bird in New Hampshire, but recently resident, best food to put out for them. I've seen them come in to sue it. Um, has, has been good for Carolina wrens at my house. I'm not sure what their seed preferences are, but fruit as well. If you have any native plants that still have fruit on them and the cedar waxwings haven't gotten to it yet, you might see Carolina wrens. Um, mealworms might also be a good attractant for Carolina wrens. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question from Jill about the accuracy of bird surveys. So when, um, when people are doing the bird surveys, especially it's the, if it's sort of citizen science, um, or community scientists, how accurate is the data collected? Excellent question. Another topic I could talk for hours about. Um, there are errors with this data collection. However, there's some really brilliant scientists working with the data and their models can account for some of that error. Um, so we still get really um, realistic and helpful spatial and statistical models about these populations, despite some error in that data collection process. So it's okay to make mistakes, I guess is my point there. Right, okay, cool. Um, this is from Brenda. She's wondering how she can better attract bluebirds. She's tried to no avail. Any tips, bluebird wrangling tips, Stephen? During the winter, put out mealworms. Um, it might take them a long time to find your feeder, but once they find it, they'll be glued to it all winter. Um, and then during the breeding season, uh, you could put out nest boxes uh, as well to help attract them. That's great. All right, I think we have time for a few more questions, maybe just one more. Um, Crystal is, uh, wants to know, do bird feeders that attract mice then give owls an easy hunting ground? I haven't so, studied that specifically. I wager that if you have a local barred owl and they've keyed in on the mice coming to your feeders at night, that they're probably gonna stick around more than, than owls who haven't figured out that trick yet. Oh, good. Phil responded too. Uh, Phil Brown, who is one of our other birding, amazing birding um, people here for the Harris Center. He said, yes, Crystal, that's where owls are often drawn to in the winter. So feed birds and don't use chemicals or pesticides to keep the prey items healthy. I like that. That's good for the bugs too. All right. I think that might be it. Let me just make sure we've gotten the question. I just want you to know, Stephen, that the um, the chat is just filled with lots of thank you and everybody really appreciates how clear and informative your presentation was and what a great job you did. So we are all just blown away. Thank you so much for sharing your passion, your expertise, and just for, for um, being there for the birds and inspiring us to get out there and, and count birds, watch birds, pay attention to birds. So thank you. My and pleasure. I hope to meet a number of you in person at a future course. Um, that I offer through the Harris Center. So enjoy the winter, enjoy birds, uh, and thank you all for attending. 
Yeah, thank you all so much and keep your eyes. Maybe we'll have a, a surprise um, winter thing with Stephen on bird feeding basics. That might be really exciting. So best to everybody, keep bird watching and thank you for coming tonight. Bye. Bye, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Thank you.